into the house of the Lord. This morning we started a new series in the book of Hebrews. We just did a series in our senior adults class, and that was very, very good Bible study. So today we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1 and read a little bit of that today. All right, if any of you couples or anybody's going to the um, Valentine date night on this Friday and you need somebody to watch your babies, please see Adam and Ashley, and they have offered to uh, take care of your little ones or tie them up somewhere or something until you get back. So please see Adam and Ashley if you need that, okay? I know you might want to get away for an evening. Thank you so much for that. This journey of faith that we're looking at this morning in the book of Hebrews, the big idea of the series this morning, this eight-week series charts a course through the book of Hebrews describing the supremacy of Christ as God's revelation, high priest, sacrifice, and giver of faith. Rather than looking to other things, people, or feelings to bring us meaning and redemption, we must look to Jesus. The big idea of today's message is that Jesus is above all and is the full, there's that word, full revelation. Jesus is the full revelation of God. Our application is that we must see Jesus as the final and full revelation of God, not just a part of God's revelation or a continuation of God's revelation, but the full and final revelation. In Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. I like that part. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name of God gave him is greater than their names. For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus, You are my son. Today I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father, he will be my son. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with the scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil, therefore O oh God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you on more than on anyone else. He also says to the Son, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old, old clothing, but you are always the same. You will live forever forever. And God never said to any of the angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. We sang a lot this morning about his name and that last hymn, glory to his name. But a lot of the songs that we sang had to do with the name of Jesus, the beautiful name of Jesus, and how victory is yours in the name of Jesus. We understand that demons tremble at the sound of that name, Jesus. Hallelujah. The worlds are in existence by the name and power of Jesus Christ. He is the full and final revelation of God himself. Well, we don't know who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. Some believe it was the Apostle Paul. Others believe it was one of the other apostles or church leaders. But whoever it was, they were writing to a Jewish audience, and they had a working knowledge of the Old Testament. So it's possible that the majority of the Hebrews are Jewish Christians, and the book was likely written between 40 and 60 A.D. Uh, We also understand 
that these first Jewish believers thought, you know, when, when Jesus came and, and they started preaching him as being the Messiah, even after his resurrection, they wanted to maintain the temple sacrifices and maintain their system of worship because they thought that at any moment Jesus would be revealed to them as the Messiah, would overthrow the Roman government, and then establish his kingdom, and so then they can continue with the, th the way things were. Even though Jesus himself had prophesied that one day, as they were looking at the temple, he said, not one stone will be left upon another. And when he said that to the disciples, they were like, wow, that means the end of the world. When is that going to happen? Tell us when it's going to be the end of the age. Because they, they associated the destruction of the temple with the end of everything. That's how they understood it. And Jesus was trying to get them to understand, no, this whole system that you're used to, this whole system of worship and sacrifice, this whole building, all of this is going to be gone. And their, their only solution was to be found in the relationship with the Messiah himself, that he was greater than the temple. He was greater than their sacrifice. He was greater than all those things. They couldn't really understand and grasp that. And so as we look in this scripture this morning, the first part we talk about prophets, kings, and priests, signs, nations, and angels. Our God has always been a speaking God, and he has continually spoken through many different ways, through many different people, generation after generation. He chose men, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and, and Aaron, and Miriam, and the list just goes on and on and on. Generation after generation, the Lord was speaking to his people so that they could have that relationship with him. He spoke into nothing and created the world. He spoke and life sprang forth out of the dirt and out of the heavens. He spoke through individuals that we mentioned, Abraham, Isaac, and all his, his heirs, all the people that he spoke through. He spoke through miracles, demonstrating his saving power, his careful provision, his mighty deliverance and conquest of enemy nations, plagues that demonstrated his power over the false gods of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea and the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to demonstrate his power over nature. He sent manna from heaven every day, six days a week for 40 years, quail in the desert, water from a rock that moved and followed them wherever they were to demonstrate his loving care, his provision and power over his people to teach them that he is the bread of life that he is the water of life that man shall not live by bread alone but by the very words of God by the spoken word of God would men find true life and true meaning and true hope he then revealed himself through the conquest of enemy nations tearing down walls by the power of a shout destroying armies that were overwhelmingly bigger and stronger to show his power and favor on those who obeyed him and his displeasure on those who disobeyed yet even after every imaginable way of God speaking and revealing himself to his people they wandered off time and time again to serve other gods and to serve worthless idols for this faithlessness they were sent into slavery captivity poverty and disgrace and we close the Old Testament like we did last week in the story of Malachi where they have finally returned to their own homeland but they were never to rise again as strong a nation as they had been before then 400 years of silence began but even in silence God had not abandoned his people God had not forgotten his people because God gave a promise in Malachi he was saying the next time I speak will be the very last time that I speak and it's going to be a full and final revelation I'm going to send somebody to come and really talk to my people so that they understand the second thing that we see now is that Jesus is the full revelation of God the Old Testament shows God working through angels through prophets through science nations through his written word through the Torah the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses the writer of Hebrews opens his discourse by saying, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways. Many of us have a godly lineage 
that we can point back to grandma or grandpa or great grandparents and, and they tell us their stories. But I'm going to tell you, I had to find my own stories. That God that they serve is a wonderful and amazing God, but he had to become my God. I couldn't ride on their coattails. I had to find that faith for myself. I had to own that faith. I had to discover the reality of what they were speaking. God spoke to them and that's great and that's good and I thank God for that. But God had to speak to me just as much as God has to speak to my children and to my grandchildren. He's got to reveal himself to them just as he has revealed himself to me. That's the whole point. It's that God continually reveals himself from one generation to another. It says in the last day, God has spoken to the world through his son Jesus. This isn't just an additional revelation equal to the word spoken to Moses or Abraham or Isaiah or David. The author wants to put an exclamation point on his proclamation that Jesus is the final word from God because he is God. We don't need to wait for another revelation. We don't need to wait for another prophet to arise. We don't need to see a sign in the clouds or a sign on the earth. Jesus is the last, the period of God's revelation. The full and final revelation of God can be found in Jesus Christ. It says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In other words, all of creation continues its existence because of his power and his spoken word. John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. And everything that was created was created by him, through him, and for him. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? The language is emphasizing that Jesus is the full representation of God. When you see Jesus, you see God. Why is that important? Because Jesus is fully God, not kind of God or mouthpiece for God, but rather he is fully God. In Colossians 1, 15 to 20, some of the most beautiful words ever penned, beautiful poem, it says, Christ is the invisible image, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, just as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth and by means of Christ's blood on the cross. If you want to read a really good book, that might can give you a little bit different perspective. If you'll get a copy of Divine Romance by Gene Edwards. In fact, you should read, of all, you should read all of Gene Edwards' books. They're amazing, really, really beautiful uh, when I read Divine Romance, and I've read it several times, I read it again this year, brought tears to my eyes. Just the way he describes the beauty of Christ and everything that occurred at the crucifixion. And, and then I've, I've read the Chronicles of the Door, which is five books also by him that describes from the beginning all the way through the rapture and, and the end of everything. It's just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And I've actually started another series by him talking about the three uh, journeys of the Apostle Paul. And again, it's just so moving the way he describes all that is going on. But I like John 14, verses 8 through 10, <clears throat> where Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. But Jesus replies, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe 
that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Here's a question for you. What makes us think that we can escape? What makes us think? This is a question that is found in the Word of God. It's in actually, actually in Hebrews. What makes us think that we can escape? There is no other revelation. There is no other way. There is only one way. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm. In every violation of the law, every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation, which was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself, and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. See, the gospel is greater than the Ten Commandments. How many love the Ten Commandments? You know, it's, oh, they're tearing down the Ten Commandments, they're taking them out of the courthouses and all that stuff. We're living in a world and in a nation that is becoming increasingly hostile to the things of God. But listen, there's something greater than the Ten Commandments. That is Jesus. He is a fuller, a deeper, and a more meaningful revelation than the Ten Commandments because Jesus is greater. The gospel is greater than the more than 600 laws and ordinances that are found in the Old Testament because Jesus is greater. The gospel is greater than Solomon's temple. But the Shekinah glory of God fell in that place that the priests couldn't even see or do anything. They had to walk out because they couldn't minister because of the Shekinah glory that fell in the temple. Yet we are told that Jesus is greater. The gospel was announced by Jesus Christ himself with the words, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He told his disciples in Luke 24, 47, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name, in the name of Jesus, to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And here was the message, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. The law, the prophets, the kings, the priests, the angels, the temple, all the sacrifices were simply a shadow, a representation of everything just pointed to the reality that is found in Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus declared, no man can come to the Father but by me. In other words, there is no other greater revelation. Jesus is the final and full revelation of God to us. There is no other one that we can pray to. There's no virgin, no saint, no dead family members, no angels. There is no other way, no other way to eternal life, no other way to find full forgiveness of our sins. God is not going to send you some other method. He's not going to show you another prophet. You don't need to chase after an evangelist. You, you don't need to find another translation of the Bible. You don't need to do any of those things because the only way you're going to make it to heaven is by trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the full and final amen for everything that God has ever tried to do in the Old Testament, the New Testament, all the way up to now. He is saying Jesus is enough. The name of Jesus is enough. Whatever your need is this morning, whatever struggle, whatever battle you're facing, God is saying to you, Jesus is enough. He is the overcomer. He is the amen. He is the alpha and omega. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So you don't need something else. It's not Jesus plus your good works. It's not Jesus plus another prophet. It's not Jesus plus this or that. It's just simply Jesus. That's all it is. He made it so simple for all of us to take that simple message of salvation to a lost and dying world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Done. Right there, he could have dropped the mic. Mic drop. He could have just, I'm done. This is it, guys. There is no other. Don't, you don't have to look for another person. You know that we got a lot of Christians looking for the Antichrist. Stop it already. You don't need to look for the Antichrist. You should live your life ready every single moment. Oh, the Antichrist is being revealed. I better get my life right. Son, you better have your life right right now. Right now. You don't need to look for the Antichrist. 
You don't need to try and discern when, you know, when Jesus is coming. Jesus, does, listen to me, Jesus does not even know when he's coming. Did you know that? Did you ever, know, did you even know that? He said, the Father has saved that date for his good pleasure. I don't even know. But I'm ready. He's, he's ready. And when the day comes that the Father says, son, go home and get your bride and bring her. That's when he knows when it's time. But until then, we, couldn't, we need to quit guessing. We need to quit looking for the Antichrist, quit looking for a sign from heaven. You know, we, we, we talk about, oh, there's, there's earthquakes everywhere. Everybody gets scared. Oh, you know, the, the Bible says there's going to be earthquakes. There's been earthquakes since creation, just about. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. Hello. Where you have humans, you're going to have wars or rumors of wars. That's our human nature. It's just going to be that way, you know. And so there's, there's always, you know, everybody says, oh, this person's going to be the Antichrist. And, I mean, there's been Antichrist. There's a lots of Antichrist. <laughs> there's been a lot of them. You know, Hitler was an Antichrist. I mean, Stalin, uh, they killed a million of their own people, millions of their own people. You know, the guy in China, the, the emperor, he killed millions and millions of his own people. I mean, Antichrist, yeah, they're, they're everything that Jesus is, they're absolutely the opposite. But we don't need to worry. We need to rest in the salvation that he gave us and rest that we know him and that we love him and that we serve him. And he's going to take care of us whether the government is good to us or whether the government is not good to us. Because the day will come when this government will turn against us they're going to shut the pulpits down. They're going to take away our tax-exempt status. Does that mean it's the end of the world? No. It does not mean it's the end of the world because there's a lot of countries where the government is very antagonistic against Christians where they don't allow preaching. You want to be a, a Christian and really suffer for Jesus? Go to Iran. Okay? And try to have a small group Bible study. See what happens. There's no tax exempt status for churches. They don't even have churches. But it has, Iran has the strongest, fastest growing church in the world right now. Did you know that? And it's mostly led by women and that they have no church buildings. But they are getting saved. And some of them are reporting, many of them are reporting in Iran of having visions of Jesus himself. And they are turning to Christ while the government is very antagonistic towards them. We enjoy this liberty in America. Thank God for that. That's why we pray. That's why we vote. But I'm telling you, well, it doesn't matter what happens in this world because God rules in the affairs of men. He decides who sits up in Washington and who doesn't. And, you know, we, we pray, and we vote, we do our part, and we get involved, and we thank God for all that. But I'm telling you, don't worry about all that stuff Get out and tell people about Jesus because that's the number one thing that we can do. There's not going to be any Republicans in heaven. No Democrats, no Independents. Come on, there won't be any Catholics or Baptists. There won't be any Assembly of God people there. Uh-oh, don't start running to the door. The only people that are going to be there are those who put their faith in Jesus Christ and have been covered by the blood of the Lamb, who said, Jesus is all I need. I don't need the government on my side. I don't need all of this. I don't need a building. All I need is Jesus because he is the full and final revelation. He is enough to meet me at my point of need. He is my bread. He is my life. He is my water. He is my resource. He is my provider. He's everything that I need today. He is. That's all I need. It's Jesus. What a beautiful, beautiful name it is. God is not going to send any other message than the message we have already received, and that message is Jesus. There is no other revelation than what he has already said, and that is Jesus. By saying this, Jesus declares that he has exclusive rights of passage to the Father and into heaven. There are no shortcuts. There's not a bunch of ways to make it into heaven. There's no good deed that will give you special entry because without Jesus, we are lost. And we need Jesus. If you're sick, I know a healer. His name is Jesus.
If you're hurting in financial realm, you need to learn how to fit, work on your finances because you just got to be smart about that stuff. But sometimes we just need to throw ourselves on Jesus. And I can tell you he has provided for us over and over and over and over again. Time and time again, God has come through one miracle after another as we threw ourselves as a family to God, trying to do what he's called us to do and say, God, we know you're going to provide. He'd speak to people in dreams and they'd bring us money. You can't even make that stuff up. He'd give people a grocery list of the exact brands that we like to eat and they'd bring it to us right when we needed it. I'm telling you, that's a miracle, a provision. Because we trusted in Christ and we were trying to do what he's asked us to do. And we still are trying to do what he's called us to do to the very best of our abilities. And he is my provider. He's still my healer. He's still my deliverer. He's still my all in all because he loves me and he loves you so much. Whatever you're facing, whatever difficulty has come your way this morning, I want you to know that Jesus loves you and he is all that you need let's go to the lord in prayer let's have our praise team come up this morning oh we exalt you lord we thank you father <clears throat> for what you are doing in our midst lord father we thank you for that full and final revelation of jesus christ our lord and savior and father there are some here this morning father that are hurting financially or physically or mentally lord and they're going through a struggle father we need jesus today to show up in a powerful way speak into our hearts speak into our lives this morning father we so thank you lord we don't need to look for another sign we don't need to look for another prophet or priest or king we just need to keep our eyes in on jesus the author and finisher of our faith the one who's able to present us faultless before the throne room of our god father we exalt you this morning let me have you stand as the Praise team's going to lead us in worship. I want to just open up the altars this morning and just give you an opportunity to come and worship. Oh, yeah.